Thank you very much for the lovely introduction and, and being allowed to come here for the third time. It's a real privilege to come and, and talk to you here. Um, I worked earlier in Oxford University. I think I left here about 2005. So it's very nice for, to walk around and all these old memories come back. So it's lovely to be here. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, for me, and this, this was a quote that Daryl took and used actually in advertising this talk, and I hadn't thought so much about it, but I wanted to, to lift up again, because for me as an applied mathematician, the calculations are secondary. Now, I'm quite good at maths, I'm quite good at calculating things and doing the manipulations required, and I suppose I teach it, so I have to be reasonably good at it, but that's never been the thing that motivates me first. I'm not one of these people who likes to sit and do long calculations. Or, well, maybe I, I like it a little bit, but not a great deal, not as much as many of my pure mathematics colleagues. The reason I got interested in mathematics, and this really came from an early age, the reason I got interested was I wanted to understand the world around me. And I felt that mathematics was the toolkit which I could use to get that understanding. And th that's what we're going to look at today. That's the story I'm going to tell. I'm going to try and give you an insight into how my own thinking works in four different stages, looking at statistical, interactive, chaotic, and complex thinking. And I'm going to illustrate it with stories. Some of them are going to come from football, because Daryl has, has told me that uh, we're, I'm very popular in my football talks, so I thought I'd throw in a little bit of football for you. Some of it is going to come from other parts of science, so I'm an active scientist working on a large range of different areas. And some of it also comes from my personal life, so how I use mathematics to think about the types of social problems that I encounter every day, how, how I interact with people, when things go wrong, how I can find a solution for them. So I'm going to take all of those three different branches, science, football, and, and our personal lives, and use them to illustrate these four different ways of thinking. So the first way of thinking we have is statistical. And when I did this, I also went back in time, and really, really, applied mathematics is just a little bit more than 100 years old, really, the, the, the things that we use today. So I went back in time and I started with various historical figures who built these things. And this is Ronald Fisher. This is him in 1912 when he was a student at Cambridge University. And Fisher was an incredibly arrogant young man. He believed that he was smarter than everybody around him. And at school, he was smarter than everybody around him. And he went to Cambridge University, which was, you know, this is going to sound controversial, but at the time, if you wanted to study mathematics, Cambridge University was the best place to study mathematics in the world. And he went there and he found that he was pretty much smarter than all the other students. And he also thought that he was smarter than pretty much all of the professors. And so you can imagine Fisher, he was sitting in his room a few weeks before the Tripos exams, which of course he aced, he was sitting in the room not studying for the exams, but he was trying to work out how the mathematics he was using was coupled to reality. He felt that when the, the people who taught him mathematics, the professors who taught him, when they used it, they didn't see the coupling between what they were proving and the results they had and how that actually could be used. And that's what he wanted to find. He was sitting looking for that solution. And it didn't go well for him, right? He wrote an article, nobody read it, nobody was interested in his ideas, and he ended up pretty much in a wilderness. He wanted to fight in World War I in 1914. He couldn't because he was too short-sighted. And he ended up buying a farm and trying to run this farm, which he was absolutely ter terrible at. He just couldn't manage to... He wasn't very good at working hard. He was good at having theoretical ideas, but not getting anything, anything done. But he was rescued, and he was rescued by a guy called Sir John Russell. And Sir John Russell, he ran Rothamsted Experimental Station. And he actually said he was looking for an, an oddball mathematician to look at all their experimental results. And so he recruited Fisher, and here is Fisher 
pictured on the left hand side. And this is how he could be typically be seen at Rothamsted. He would be sort of puffing smoke and explaining ideas to people. And in this picture, he's at a tea party. Now, Sir John Russell, um, he instigated the tea party because at Rothamsted in 1919, um, they started to have women working there. And he felt that if they had lady employees, he didn't really know what to do with them. But he knew one thing, they needed to drink tea. And so he made, he made tea for these. Uh, so they started to have a, a tea party for these, um, uh, for the woman ostentation, uh, essentially. But he went on, oh, well, everybody had the tea in the end. And they became a very central part of what was done at Rothamsted. Now, at one of these tea parties, um, the, there was a, a, um, a Dr. Muriel Bristol, who was one of the experimentalists and one of the people who did the studies on crops. And Fisher was about to serve her tea, and she said, stop, I need to have my milk first. And Fisher, as usual, in his arrogant way, he just he said, nonsense, this can't be true. It doesn't matter if you have your milk first in your tea. You can have your milk afterwards. You know, it all mixes up together. There's no difference if you have your milk first or if you have your milk afterwards. And so, and he wasn't, he wouldn't just stop there. He wasn't happy until he'd done an experiment and tested if Dr. Muriel, Muriel Bristol could tell the difference between uh, if she had her milk first or her tea first in her tea. And so he set up an experiment to do the test, or he got his, some of his colleagues, they suggested various methods how they might do that. And I'm now going to ask you, actually. So we want to test if Dr. Muriel Bristol can tell the difference between if the milk goes into her tea first or if the tea is put in before the milk. And I'm going to allow you to consider three different ways, or two different ways plus another alternative for doing this test. So the first is to offer her a pairwise challenge. We offer her a milk cup and a non-milk cup, and then we maybe randomize these in different ways, and we have four tests for her. The other one is we present her with a tray with milk and non-milk um, tea on the tray, and we ask her to identify the ones that were milk first and the ones that were not milk first. Okay, so hands up, who thinks that the pairwise test is the best way to do this? We've got a few people at the back. Hands up, who thinks that the milk first, tea first tray is the best? You can do better than this. Okay, now we've got a few more hands up. So I'm taking the rest of you uh, going for option C, and you're thinking that there's no difference between these two methods, that they're both the same. Okay, so I'm not sure if that's... Okay, hands up if you do think there's no difference between the two methods. I think we've got a little bit of a majority there for, for option B. Okay, so let's have a look at this. And this is the working that, um, that Fisher did. So if you've got a pairwise challenge, option A, when you're setting up the experiment, and this is key to how Fisher was thinking, when you're setting up the experiment, you have... 16 different ways you can organize the cups. So the black one, the black circle there is, is tea first, the white circle is milk first, and you have four different pairs, and there's 16 different ways of arranging those pairs. So that's two to the power of four is 16, and the probability, and this is the, the key here, the probability that Muriel Bristol gets this right is one in 16. She has to, in order to get them all right, well, if she, if, she, if she can't tell the difference, the probability she gets them all right is 1 in 16. Now, if we do it option B, the one that you liked, and this is going to prove to be the better choice, there are eight places to put out the first cup, seven places for the uh, second cup, these are the milk cups, f um, six places for the third cup, and five places for the fourth cup, and you've put them out at random, and then you fill up with the these would be the, the milk ones, and you fill up with the non-milk ones. And then you can also think of the ordering of the cups. There's four times, three times, two times, one ways to do it. And using combinatorics, you can find out, well, there's 70 ways of placing the cups. And if you don't believe the math, you can sit and write them all out. And I got, I got a little, yeah, I, I told you I don't like calculating. So I got a little bored, bit bored before I wrote all of the different ways you can arrange the cups out, but you can arrange them in these different ways. 
And so if Muriel Bristol can't tell the difference, the probability of getting all four right is now only one in, in 70. So the, the, this test is the better way to do it. And this, I think, is a perfect example of using a nice piece of mathematics in the form of combinatorics, and that's what Fisher did. He used different parts of combinatorics to solve a problem in experimental design. And he went on to write a book, which became, is still a sort of handbook used today of how you design different experiments. This is a slightly, this is his Latin square design, which is a different design than the randomized design we just talked about. But he could then, from there, start to spread his statistical ideas. And there's just an incredible power, I think, in being able to think about the correct way to do an experiment or the correct way to analyze data. Now, I like to, so I've, I, as Daryl said, I, I have worked on football and I've worked in mathematics in football. And this has taken me on some amazing journeys. And it's very nice to, for example, I was, had a um, thing with Gary Neville. So I like to show off now about my sort of footballing contacts. I think Gary Neville is the most famous uh, footballer I've, I've met on my journeys. So I just wanted to sort of throw that in there. Um, and and what's, what's invariably happens when I talk to footballers or former footballers or coaches about, about, foot, about mathematics and football is that they have this thing where they say, oh, well, you know, numbers can tell us something, numbers can tell us a few things, but you can't measure a player's attitude. You can't measure. And, and so Gary said that when we did this thing together, he said, oh, you can't measure if a team goes a goal down you can't measure the player who really gets everyone going and really rallies the team and gets them going again. And I was sitting there thinking, yeah, actually, that's exactly what you can measure with statistics. And so a few days after um, Gary, Gary said this, I sent him an analysis where we analyzed exactly that. We looked to see what happens when a team, um, so when a team uh, concede a goal. So this is Trent Alexander-Arnold in a game in the 21-22 uh, season and the line, the central line here, the central dotted line where, which is highlighted is when they conceded a second goal against United. They lost the game 2-1 in the end and just after half time they conceded a second goal and the squiggly line that's going up and down that's Trent Alexander-Arnold's performance on the ball and as time goes on, you can see that he's getting better and better. He's, he's actually producing lots of good passes for his teammates. And then the goal goes in, dotted line, and then you see his performance drops back down again. And so in this particular case, if we do the Gary... So we ended up calling this the Gary Neville statistic. So if we do the Gary Neville statistic on this, his performance goes down after they concede a goal compared to his performance in the 15 minutes before they concede a goal. So it's a measurable statistic. And in this way, you can, for example, we looked at the top strikers in 21-22, and it was quite interesting because you might call um, Jamie Vardy a player who's got a lot of attitude or character or something like that. And then it turns out that's what we got when we measured it. When, when, um, when Jamie Vardy's team went down, they went down a little bit more often than some of the other teams, but he got better 29 of the times, worse 13 of the times, and his performance was uh, the same about five of the times. And you can see, yeah, there's a ranking of the top five players for that season in these different situations. And it's very nice, I've put in parentheses here because we used precisely one of Ronald Fisher's tests, Fisher's exact test, in order to test if these players were statistically better when their, when their team went down or not. And so there's all types of ways in which we can use statistics. Another um, example, and now we're kind of moving over to the edges of the limits of statistics. And I think that this is a very important point because while, while I think Gary is wrong in that you can't measure attitude at all, he's right in another way because you can't measure everything. You can measure certain aspects of how a player gets better. It's one piece of information you have, but you can't measure everything. And this is from a study uh, from a, a TED talk. And during the writing of the book, I watched a 25 
most popular TED Talks because I was very interested how they use statistics in order to assess the validity of claims in TED Talks. And um, this was a talk by Angela Duckworth and she said that grit, and grit is the idea of determination, how determined you are to succeed, that grit is the strongest predictor of success. And it comes from a study that she conducted um, together with some colleagues. And what they did is they looked at Ivy League undergraduates, I think at Yale, they looked at US military cadets, and they looked at people who were competing in a spelling bee. And before they started doing these activities, they asked them questions about how, if you start something, do you always see it through it? Those types of questions, a series of 12 questions about if they were determined, gritty types of people. And they found that grit, this, the answers that people gave in those questions, were some of the biggest predictors of success. And that's what she said in the, in the talk. And that sounds very impressive, a bit like me trying to persuade Gary, uh, Gary Neville that we can, we can measure um, attitude in football players. But if you look a little bit more closely at this, the actual study, as opposed to the, yes, we shouldn't measure, we shouldn't measure success on how many times people have watched a YouTube video, because this YouTube video has been watched 25 million times. And it's, it's not Angela Duckworth who wrote the headline on it, but her paper reveals quite clearly, and she doesn't try to hide this in any way at all, that grit just explains 4% of the variance between people. Now, 4% of the variance, how much is that? It, it, isn't, it doesn't mean that only 4% of people are explained by this. I, I'm going to try and show you what 4% of the variance looks like. 4% of the variance looks like this. So, if you measure grit, on the scale one to five on the bottom here, and you look at grade point averages, for example. Now, this isn't real data. This is data I've just made up in order to illustrate what 4% of the variance looks like. 4% of the variance would have some type of relationship a bit like that. And you can see, if you squint carefully, I can't see it from this angle, but I think maybe you can squint and see this. There is a kind of increasing trend there between grit and grade point average. But you also see there's some people who, yeah, and there's, there's lots of people who are very gritty and are successful, and there's people who aren't gritty and aren't successful. But there's also lots of people who are very gritty and don't get a high grade. And there's lots of people who aren't very gritty and do get a high grade. And so when you're interpreting this, you shouldn't confuse, so I often say that you shouldn't confuse the forest for the tree. You're a tree, right? Every person in this, in this room is a tree. So if we tested all of your grittiness and your success in life, we'd find some kind of relationship like this. But it wouldn't mean that you necessarily, as an individual, um, had this relationship between grit. So if you're not a gritty person, if you never see through any projects you start, you don't need to worry at all. You're going to be absolutely fine. There's lots and lots of ways in which your life can succeed. And this... What, what I've tried to do here, and I'm not sure if I've got the arc quite right here, but the, the arc I want to describe here is I, I want to start by saying statistics is very powerful. I can show off to Gary Neville about it. But then at some point, statistics doesn't actually give you all of the answers, right? And that's very well illustrated if we actually go back to Ronald Fisher, this rather arrogant young undergraduate student. Because... Ronald Fisher also has another side to his story. He was from a very early age, and this picture was taken in 1912, very interested in eugenics. And he had this idea that we needed to breed people to be more like him, like to be more clever and smart and good at maths and so on. And he campaigned all the way up to the war. I think after the war, he kept more quiet about this. But all the way up to the war, he campaigned for, for example, sterilizing people who were considered feeble-minded. And this is, this is, of course, horrible. And I mean, it's a horrible thing to think about. But not only is it like morally repugnant, it's also scientifically wrong. They couldn't find any kind of gene for, uh, for feeble-mindedness. There is no correlation between, or there's a very weak correlation or no correlation at all between feeble-mindedness in one generation in mothers 
and in their daughters. So this was a relationship that was scientifically dubious that he continued to press forward. And the reason he was successful is because, or the reason he was successful in pushing his, forward, his, his thing forward was that he would use statistics in order to sort of attack his opponents. He would call them all stupid, they didn't understand statistics. So he would actually use statistics to undermine other people's arguments in a really counterproductive way. He took a fake theory and then used statistics to defend it. And he didn't just do this once. After the war, when he'd given up on, um, on uh, eugenics, or at least stopped talking about it, he then did the same thing on smoking. So as we saw in the first picture, he was a very keen smoker. And to him, there was just no possibility that smoking could cause cancer. And so he spent a lot of time investigating very narrow areas of science, doing his statistics on that, and trying to convince people that smoking didn't cause cancer. And I don't know the effect that this research had, but certainly you've got one of the leading statisticians in the world who's defending this position for a long, long time. And that illustrates a lot of why statistics is um, a limited approach. So I've written down a few, a few sort of bullet points here. So statistical thinking doesn't provide all the answers. Um, one problem is, and I, I didn't really get into this, but I mean, what a dick he is, right? <laughs> I mean, why do you need to test if she you know, can tell the difference between the milk first? Everyone was very happy. They were all just enjoying their tea party and suddenly he's doing a statistical test. I mean, yeah, he's an idiot. So, so that's one thing. And, and I really think, I, you know, we joke about that, but we see it at work all the time, you know, it's always being told that we should be te there should be st statistical tests and metrics made about us and things like that. And we don't need as much quantification as we have. Then there's the effect size thing. We sometimes talk about statistical significance. You can have statistical significance, but still have a very small effect size. And that's the confusing the tree in the forest. Many non-gritty individuals are successful in life. Context is always important. So just because a player is more active when their team goes a goal down does not imply the team plays better. Just because Ronaldo demands that everyone gives him the ball when they go a, a goal down, or um, Jamie Vardy demands that he gets the ball, that doesn't mean that the team actually does better as a result of that. So it's very important to think about the context of these types of things. And then, as we all know, correlation and causation, they're not the same thing. But that leads us to the, to the next step. We need to think about ways to tease out causation. We want to be able to tease out our understanding of the world. One thing causes another. And it brings us very nicely on to interactive thinking. And that's the next step on from statistical thinking. And I have another hero. I can reassure you that this hero is not going to turn out to be a raving racist who bullies all of his co-workers. So um, there are a few mathematicians who haven't done that in their lives, just a few of them, but they're, they're around. And this is Alfred J. Lotka. Um, and he was originally a chemist, and he started his, uh, uh, his, he was originally from Poland, but he did his uh, undergraduate degree in Birmingham. And I, I really like his story because he started working in this chemistry lab, and he was kind of disappointed with what he saw when he was doing his experiments. I mean, it's a long time since I did chemistry at school, but it can be a little bit disappointed. You know, you, you get the acid and the alkali, you mix them together and there's some salt and water. It's not always the most exciting thing you've ever seen. And so we see these stable, stable reactions just come to equilibrium. But in the evening, he was reading all of these books, like Charles Darwin's book, and he was thinking about biology and just all of the exciting patterns we see, all the motion and movement of animals, all the firing of our brains, everything that happens in society. And he was thinking, why can't chemistry produce anything like that? I mean, we know that chemistry must be the underlying building block of it, but it's not something we see. We can't make that relationship together. And the way he solved the problem was he basically cheated. And he, he did the following thing. So if, if the, we've all done this in school, 
we've balanced equations, right? So we've balanced reactions. And if you've got uh, two, two H2, well, we've got four hydrogen atoms, two oxygen atoms, and they react to get to make two water molecules. So that's a, a standard chemical reaction. And the important point here is that this is balanced. So there's four hydrogens and two oxygens on the left, and there's four hydrogens and two oxygens on the right. But what Lotka said is, well, I'll just forget about that balance thing. Even though I can't find a chemical reaction that is unbalanced, I'll just think in my head, I'll do a thought experiment, and this is where it's lovely with mathematics, I'll do a thought experiment where I ignore the fact that I can't balance my reactions. And so he, he wrote down these equations. He said that, imagine an R that becomes two R's, and imagine an R plus an F which becomes two F's. And you can see that these aren't balanced. There's one R on the left-hand side of the first one, two R's on the right. Yeah, there's, you, you can see that they're just not balanced. And I've written down here below, the way you can think about these things are rabbits and foxes. So, and, and they're not, it's not a realistic model of rabbits and foxes. You've got to think of the idea of one little rabbit hopping around and suddenly there's two little rabbits hopping around. We know it's a little bit more complicated than that. But we'll start with that idea and then a fox comes and it eats a rabbit and then it makes another fox. That's, that's what the model says. It gives a, a rough idea of how ecological interactions work. And he took that and he wrote down differential equations. I wanted to put in a few of these equations here to give you a feeling for how they work. The, the equations on the left here, one of them, uh, I'm not going to get you to understand every detail of the equation, but what I want to give you a feeling for is on the left is the rate of change of the rabbits and the foxes. So dr by dt is the rate of change of the rabbits, df by dt is the rate of change of the foxes. And on the right are the things which cause that change. So I mentioned here that we want to get causation into our equations. So on the right are the things which cause that change. And rabbits increase when there's lots of other rabbits. They have lots of little bunny rabbits. And then they uh, are eaten by the foxes. So the more F they are, if we look at this BRF term, that's the rate at which the, um, the rabbits are eaten by the foxes. And then when we come down, we have the opposite relationship for, for the foxes. The foxes grow when there's more rabbits, and then they eventually die off um, of old age. There's nothing which hunts the foxes in, in, this, in this scenario. Now, again, I'm not going to solve all of these equations, but I did want to mention a little bit about how you can think about them and understand them. And on the right here, I actually learnt this from Philip Maney um, when I was here in, in Oxford about these types of methods. But he had a very lovely method a professor of mathematical biology here, for solving these equations without solving them. So you can split up the plane of foxes and rabbits, and you can identify a point on that plane and look to see, do the rabbits increase or do the foxes increase? So in the bottom left-hand corner, the foxes go down because there's not enough rabbits to eat, but the rabbits go up because there's not enough foxes eating them. And that goes on until there's a sufficient number of rabbits, and then the foxes start increasing. So in the bottom right-hand corner, this arrow points up. And if that arrow points up, well, then the foxes increase. And when the foxes increase, they start to eat the rabbits, and the rabbits go down. And you start to get this circling round and round of foxes and rabbits. And you can do, basically show this without explicitly solving the equations that there's going to be cycles round and round of these foxes and rabbits. We're going to get this interesting interaction. And if we look at it over time, um, we have these periodic oscillations of the foxes and the rabbits. Now, this whole way of thinking, which Lotka introduced, turned out to be useful in all sorts of situations. Now, the one thing we should we try not to mention, but can't be unmentioned in any mathematical modeling thing. We try not to mention this, but it's also used in pandemic modeling. And you've all heard about these epidemic curves and R values and so on. Um, but that's the same thing, that a susceptible plus an infective becomes two infectives. And that's an example of one of Lotka's unbalanced equations, which allows us to describe how an epidemic, reaction, uh, epidemic will spread through a group of people. Now, I'm not going to 
go into, as I said, I don't want to talk too much about epidemics, but this example I really love, so I'm going to talk about this example. This is a study we did, I did together with some colleagues, and this is a very cruel, well, it's not, it's not, it's not that cruel, but we, have, we had a group of undergraduate students. We got a third, a third year undergraduate student to give a seminar to first year undergraduate students. And we told the first year undergraduate students, you know, remember to give a round of applause after um, the seminar, just to show your appreciation. And then what we were really interested in was how people applauded. What are the cues that make people applaud? And we could see that people start applauding when other people around them start applauding. And you basically have an epidemic of applause. And that's what the first green curve shows. That's the number of people clapping. That's the spread of the applause virus going through the group. But then, and this doesn't happen in real diseases, you also have a social recovery. So when people stop clapping, they look around and they hear that other people have stopped clapping. And it was actually a little bit like when Daryl left the room just now. There was a sort of start signal there that there might be something going on that we might be about to start. And you all started to go down in volume and suddenly everyone was quiet. And that's the type of social effect. We're very aware of all kinds of small social details and these spread through us in a group. And the, the conclusion that what I love about the recovered thing is because we have that social recovery. So, and I try to always remember this, that if at the end of a talk you've given or a presentation, if the clapping goes on for a long time, that's not because you gave a good talk, it's just because your audience aren't particularly coordinated. So they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't manage to, to stop together. And I think that's what, that's what I would encourage you to think about. And I said that I also wondering about the personal aspects of this. It's nice just to sit sometimes and think about the social reactions that you have in your life and how they work. And I've written down a few of them. I haven't told you what they are yet, so I'll tell you what, what they are. The top, the top one, that I was imagining, this is a person P, and then it's plus an O. This is a sofa that the person has outside the house. And so we have P plus O goes to P plus O. If you're just one person and you've got a sofa outside the house, you're going to still be one person and you can't get the sofa into the house. So what you have to do, and this is the bottom equation, is you have to get a friend. And so the bottom one is 2P, two people, plus a sofa that's outside the house. It's still two people, you've still got your people afterwards, but you've moved your sofa into the living room. And you can write those social interactions for every type of um, activity. The one on the right here, the ones on the right here, I was thinking about smiling. So if you're a smiley person, Y, and you meet a non-smiley person who's X, then if you smile, then hopefully they become a smiley person too. But that's not always the case. Sometimes, you know, you don't always start smiling because somebody else is smiling. They might just be an idiot who's just smiling for no reason at all. What happens most often, actually, in human social interactions is, they, is you believe the following equation, the, one, the equation at the bottom. This is the most common equation, I think, that describes human behavior. And that's that a non-smiling person plus two smiley people will become three smiley people because then they're convinced there actually must be something to smile at. And I use that a lot in my thinking. If, if I'm thinking about how to, in the book, I take an example of if I'm trying to get a group, if a group of friends are trying to get going with some kind of healthy activity, maybe they spend a lot of time sitting in the pub together, don't really go out and do any exercise together. It's not enough for one of them to become a why to, to try and get them going. But you have to have two of them and they have to have a really sustained effort. And over time, then you get this tipping point effect where everybody starts to move over and starts, starts to engage in the healthy activity. So those are the types of things you have to think about. What type of chemical reaction, what type of social reaction am I involved in? And that's been a lot of, to be honest, this has taken up a lot of my adult life is studying these types of things. And to give you a little bit of a flavor of the sorts of things we do, this is just to give a sort of overall representation, but um, when we modeled fish, for example, we would create models which described their social interactions, described how one fish turned left if another fish turned left, if another fish turned right, and so on. 
Then we were building the top there. It's a mathematical model. We've built a fish movement and so on. So we'd show that these simple rules of interaction would produce their collective behavior. Then we'd study also the, the movement of individual fish. That's the colored idea at the, the bottom. Then we'd actually frighten all of the fish and we'd look at how they made an escape wave. We'd, we'd measure that escape wave and then we'd use models to understand that escape wave. And it's a very powerful way of thinking throughout science that you can build up these models of interaction, you compare them to reality and build a better and better understanding of fish behavior. And we do a lot of similar things in football. So this is an example of an attacking run by Marcus Rashford. And the model that we build for these types of situations this red area here shows the territory that he controls. And this is a physics-based model where we say how, far, how fast can he run, where can he get to, and we can actually describe what area he, he occupies and also the value of that area. So how likely is his getting a pass at that particular point going to lead to a goal? And that allows us to actually scout players based on their runs, and it even allows us to scout runs where they don't get the ball. So in this example, we're, we're interested in Luke Shaw here, and he's doing a run here on the left, and he doesn't get the pass. He'd love to have this pass, but he doesn't get it. But we can still measure the value that that pass created. So you can look at these counterfactual situations for, um, for, for football players. And this is a very powerful method. The interactive way of thinking allows us to build up our understanding of systems. It doesn't have the same kind of, I suppose the statistics has a sort of more of a grounding feeling to it. This, we use our imagination much more. We try to use our imagination to increase our understanding and then build mathematical models to test that understanding. Now I wanted to go back to Lotka because um, there are also limits to this way of thinking. And of course, I wouldn't have four if we'd, if we'd solved it all now. So there's, the, there's limits to this. And those limits were limits that Lotka himself hit. He wrote a book called Elements of Physical Biology. And he's one of these, these mathematicians who, and this happens a lot to us, is we sort of just get carried away and we believe that we can just explain everything with mathematics, that there's nothing that we can't explain. And so he built models, he built models of consciousness, he built models of, of our whole society, and he believed that all of them could be understood using his reaction dynamics. And it really, yeah, he, he didn't, I mean, and this was, I suppose it was a very valiant effort. This is in 1922, he finished his, his magnus opus. So he didn't even have a computer or anything to simulate these types of models on. But he never really succeeded in pinning down one essential way in which you should approach all sorts of problems. He, he ended up kind of split between lots and lots of different small things. And that I can, personally, I can relate to that very well, because that tends to be how I work with lots of problems. There's lots of different methods and you're doing lots and lots of small different things in order to get your solution. The day of, day of an applied mathematician isn't, it's not like these theoretical physicists, you know, they have like this beautiful theory of everything and they can come here and just say, oh, it's all this and you go, wow. But no, it's not like that. It's more that you're sort of tinkering around with small different problems in lots and lots of different ways. So Lotka never found his grand theory of everything using interactive theory, thinking. And one of the reason, one of the reasons he never found his grand theory was because he didn't know about chaos, which is the third way of thinking. Now, to introduce chaos, I'm going to go to another mathematical hero. This is Margaret Hamilton, and she was also, like the other two we've met, prodigious at school, very talented undergraduate student, she wanted to go on and do a PhD in pure mathematics, but her husband also wanted to do a PhD, and this is now in the 1960s, and she ended up moving to Boston, and she also had to get a job, she had a, a daughter to support, a husband to support, and so she had to get a job to support them. But the job that she got was programming 
this machine, the LGP30. And she fell immediately in love with this computing machine because she hated making mistakes. She hated errors. Whenever she calculated anything, she calculated it perfectly. And now she found that she could actually program this first computer to do the same calculations. And she got access to this computer because she was working in the lab of a person called Edward Lorentz, who was a professor of meteorology, but also with a mathematical background. There are a lot of mathematicians in this talk. So, um, and he, he wanted to predict the weather. He wanted to predict the future weather based on uh, temperature, pressure, and so on in different areas. Could he predict the weather into the future? And she started writing uh, computer code to do this. And this involved writing and doing punch cards at the time. And she'd run her computer code. And they did this one thing, is that they simulated, they simulated the weather one day. And the next day, they decided to check their results by simulating, making the exact same simulation on the computer to check that everything worked. But they found on the second day, they got a different result than on the first day. And Margaret was distraught because she didn't like making mistakes. She didn't want to think there was a mistake in her code, but she started going through the code and there was no errors in the code. And what they found was that the output of the simulation was in six decimal places, while the input they put into it was in three decimal places. So there was an error in the input in the fourth decimal place. And this meant that the weather simulation made completely different predictions in the future, going like a few, 10 days into the future in the simulated world. It made completely different predictions in the future. And I didn't mention that this was a system of 14 differential equations that she solved. We've moved on from Lotka and Volterra and two. So she solved these 14 differential equations and they make just this small error in the value you put in makes a massive difference. And that is the first indication of the butterfly of chaos, which many of you will be familiar with. And Lorenz went on, he worked with, um, I say Lorenz went on, Margaret Hamilton, we're going to find, also went on to, to do some very impressive things. But Lorenz went on with the help of Ellen Fetter, who replaced uh, Margaret Hamilton as his programmer, to produce what we now know as the, we often think of this picture, I think, or I think of it as being the butterfly of chaos. And what it illustrates is if you do start with two points very close to each other, we've moved now down from 14 dimensions to three dimensions again. If you start with two points very close together and they start to diverge, they'll move around on the same attractor on this shape that we have here, but they'll never come close, or they might come close to each other for a short amount of time, but they'll then live their own life. And so when we move from two dimensions up to three, we have this chaotic movement where things never come back to the same place again. I think, I think, I think we're going to do my experiment. OK, so I think, I think we're going to do the experiment. And then I'll, I'll, I'll boot out something else, because you've listened to me patiently for 50 minutes, so you have to get to do the experiment. OK, so here we're going to, we're going to do this. So I want you to work in pairs. I want you, one of you should think of it, so, so look at the person next to you, and you might be a new friend that you've got today, um, or it uh, might be somebody that you came with. And then I want, think, I want one of you to think of a number between 1 and 99. Then you tell that number to the other person, and the other person follows the, follow, the, the following rules. So if the number is less than 50, double it, and this is the new number. I chose 42 because you can never have a math talk without 42 in it. So 42 times 2 is 84, and so that's all you do. You just double the number. Now, if the number is greater than 50, take it away from 100 and then double it to get the new number. So if I have 84, then I have 100 minus 84 is 16, times 2 is 32. Now say the new number to your partner, and they repeat step 1 and 2. So we'll do this, for, um, do this with either with the person you came with or somebody who's nearby to you. We'll do this for about two minutes, and then we'll see where we get to. I think, you've, uh, I think you've done it very nicely, Dan. I can see the, I can see, the, uh, hear the murmur of numbers everywhere. Very, very lovely. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get you all to come up here and present your results. I just wanted to give you, get, get you to get a feeling of this type of process. 
Um, you're not generating purely chaotic numbers when you do this. If you'd started with 20, for example, you would have found yourself cycling around quite quickly. But if you started with a number that's not divisible by five, you would have probably been on quite a long trajectory through different numbers. And the point I want to make about this process is the following, is that close together numbers very quickly diverge. So if one group over there had started with 13 and another group over here had started with 14, by the end of just this short period where you got to say the numbers to each other, you would have been on very different numbers. So you have 13, 26, 52, 96, 8, 16, 32, 64, 14, 28, 28 is not so far from 26, 56, 52, they're still together, 88, 96, they're starting to get away from each other. But the big jump is now, one of them sort of goes over the threshold and one of them doesn't. So you've got 8 and 24, 16, 48, and then you've got 32 and 96 and 64 and 8. So within a few steps, these numbers have diverged quite far from each other. I don't know if any, any of you took decimal numbers. Um, <laughs> you didn't think of that. But if you do take decimal numbers, then you get true chaos from this thing for almost any real number you choose, you will get, if you take plus 0.1 in this case only, so this is 14.1 compared to 14.2, you start to, they're together for a few steps, but after about 7, 8, 9, 10, they go apart. They come a little bit together again for a while, but then they diverge, and you've got very different paths for those two numbers. And we often illustrate this um, using something called a cobweb diagram. So the idea here is you take the number from one step, the previous number might be around 20, for example, it will uh, jump up to be around 40, then it will go to 80, then it will crash down to around 20 again, and then it will start to move around everywhere on this. And one of the reasons I wanted you to do this experiment is what was being, what I could hear from your perspective was a mumble of uniform distributed random numbers. You were essentially going through a lot of integers and everywhere in the room there was a different point in this distribution. You basically had this uniform distribution of numbers that was sort of uh, kind of coming up to me. And I think it's really lovely to think of that, that you're all doing the same process, you're all doing exactly the same thing, yet you kind of have this hum, this distribution, this background of very different numbers. And that is the butterfly of chaos. And, and, and for me, it illustrates, there's, there's an important point here. I, I think chaos is wonderful. Margaret Hamilton, she hated chaos, right? And she, she left Lorenz's lab and she'd learned a valuable lesson from working on these weather simulations. And it was that she doubled down and made even fewer errors. And she wanted to work in the most extreme um, conditions possible where you couldn't make errors. And so she got a job for NASA and she became the head of the software engineering, which created the software that sent, that was on the Apollo moon mission. And so she, was, she created the software that the astronauts used to tell them how to, to do navigational decisions, to control the thrusters, to, um, uh, to update, to know where the position of the ship was. And she was in the control room when they, when they made the actual landing on the moon. And so I see this as a situation where you sort of have to choose, right? In, in, if, you're, if you're going to control something because of chaos, if there's something you really care about or there's something that's really important, then you have to treat it like Margaret Hamilton does. You have to treat it like the moon landing. There's no error, there's no room for any type of error. But you can't have control over everything. So I, I often think about this in football because there's always going to be butterflies in other situations. So here, this isn't the uniform distribution as you generated, but it's the Poisson distribution. There are lots of other situations, football being one of them, where we just can't avoid randomness. Randomness is always going to pop up. We can. We can control a pass like we talked about with the pass to Mike, Marcus Rashford, but we can't control what happens in 90 minutes of a football match. Football is to, very, to a very large degree random. And I like to think about it 
like this. I like to think about it as the yin and yang theory of randomness. So yang is order, and on short time scales, things we really care about, we can control them and we can build models of them and we can understand them. But yin is disorder, and the, on longer time scales, we just have to admit there's things that we can't control that are beyond our control. And I actually found this personally very useful because my wife is a bit more order and I'm a little bit more chaos in many situations. And she wants to plan like what we're going to have for dinner every evening. She wants to plan quite a lot of details of how the week should look. And I'm like, oh, whoops, I've got to go off and do this talk in Oxford or uh, I, don't, I can't quite remember the things that I've planned and said that I'll do, and I'm kind of, you know, and so I have a kind of more random approach. And first of all, when I looked at chaos theory, I thought chaos theory was the perfect, it was a perfect justification of my chaotic behavior. I could just go around, because there was no controlling anything, so, you know, why bother? And I didn't explain this to my wife, obviously, but um, I, I, I thought a little bit about that. But then, actually, when I heard about Margaret Hamilton, I understood it a little bit better. If there are things you really care about, then you make effort to control them. And my wife and I, we found more of that balance, and now I have discussed it a bit more with her, is that we make sure there are things that are important, like that we eat dinner together every evening, and we make sure that we do those things. And some of the other things, like if there's a big pile of dirty laundry that needs to be done or cutting the grass, we let them go over to chaos when we feel like doing them. So it's really, I think, this nice way to find yin and yang in your life, to know that if you really care about something, control it well. If you don't care as much, just let the chaos take over. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, I have gone over time, and, and you wanted to know, of course, what is the fourth... Well, we've, 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 found, a, yeah, we've found the three ways of thinking. I won't review them because um, I'm not going to go over time. The fourth way of thinking... I am going to spend a little less time on the fourth way of thinking for a reason. And one of the reasons is that you can maybe go out and buy the book and find out about the fourth way of thinking. But I would say a little bit about it because I also think... I do think it's something which should inspire younger researchers thinking about how they're going to make the next step in this. And this is a simulation produced by one of my master's students, Michael Hansen. And maybe some of you will have heard about cellular automata models before. There's this, the game of life is the most famous one where there's interaction rules. And I gave my students a task to make up their own cellular automata that made the most complex pattern possible. And Michael, Michael came up with the following rules. He had the bone, the white cells, so they only interact with the cells nearby. So this is a 100 by 100 grid of cells, but the cells only interact nearby. Um, and the rule for the white ones is that they become goo, which is dark blue, if less than four of their neighbors are bone, the white ones, otherwise they remain bone. And then the goo ones, the dark blue, these become fluid, which is the light blue, if less than three of their neighbors are bone, otherwise they remain goo. And then for fluid, which is the light blue one, these become bone, if two or more of their neighbors are bone. Now, the exact details of the, the rules aren't important. What I think is amazing is that you just have these simple rules which describe how cells interact with each other, and suddenly they're creating these very splendid structures. There's a and the reason I called the white ones bone is that they stretch out and they kind of form this skeleton. And between that skeleton, you have alternating dark blue, light blue patterns pumping backwards and forward. So with very simple local interactions, you have an extremely complex behavior. And another example of this, and this is something you can um, find on Twitter. This has become a competition. So these are these are all computer graphics, and every one of those computer graphics is produced with code that is a Twitter-length piece of code. So that means it has to be 240 characters long. And so there's a whole kind of culture on Twitter of who can create a graphic with 240 characters. And each one of these you can create, you use fractals, of course, and you use shading, um, and you can create these kind of movies. Um, of tree, uh, they look like trees, look like flowers. Yeah, it seems like a lot of these things look like goo, and then you have some sort of flowery thing there as well. 
just by a very short code. And that brings us to who is the theory, who is the hero of the last part of the book, the scientist who's the, the hero of the last part of the book. And that's um, Kolmogorov, because he defined complexity, or he didn't define complexity as such, but he said a pattern is as complex as the length of the shortest description that can be used to produce it. And I find that a very useful way for thinking about science and thinking about how we understand the world. If we can find a way of describing something that doesn't lose the detail, doesn't lose the nuance, but captures it, then we can start to actually capture complexity. And so that's the thought I, I want to leave you on. And thank you for being patient with me. Thanks. <laughs>